Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm just going to raise this uh, shade on the screen here. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Would that be like too late to like get feedback? Uh, not necessarily, but I might not be able to return the comments until like tomorrow evening. Okay. And then you'd still have some time to think about it, but okay. uh, but just because I have like a, a full schedule today and then into tomorrow, but I might be able to get it in before the middle of the day tomorrow. So okay. yeah, I would say try your best and I can probably at least offer something. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, your cases seem like they're going to be so easy to explain until you like actually try to explain it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's tricky with philosophy. That's that's always how it is. You think you understand, and then it starts slipping away. But um, but it just gets easier over time. Okay, everyone. Just a couple minutes to go until we start. Hello there. <laughs> hey, Kylie, welcome back. <clears throat> Hey there. Welcome everybody. Just, just a second, we'll get started. Brandon, Sebastian, welcome. Sure. Got you there. Hi, Annabella. <clears throat> okay, everyone, let's go ahead and just get this underway for now. Thanks, as usual, for being here this morning. And um, just to be all clear, we have a couple of lectures left, and then next week we have two review sessions to get ready for the final. Don't forget that your second paper is due Friday this week before class time, so you just email me your um, submission whenever you're ready. Uh, and I will distribute the study guide for the upcoming final exam and review sessions in the next few days. Um, I think I'll do this tomorrow, actually, in the middle of the day sometime. So after that, you can start looking at the topics and the different study guide questions to get your notes ready for the review sessions. Next week, Wednesday and Friday, that's what we will uh, be focused on, just the study guide. And then you'll have your exam during finals week. Um, so I think that's all pretty clear. The last few meetings just have to do with this final topic that we're all covering, which is life and death, what would make a human life go well. Um, so I'll start today's meeting by just kind of going over some of the uh, summary of last, last lecture on the work of Plato. And then we'll press forward with the next author in the series, who is Jean-Paul Sartre. He has a way different account of what makes a human life go well than, than Plato did. Okay, and as usual, I hope you guys are all doing well. Feel free to leave behind any comments, questions, or you know anything at all in the chat whenever you're ready or whenever you want. Okay, then. So let me start off with just a quick little um, breezy review of the last meeting. So Plato, ancient Greek philosopher, had a certain perspective on what makes a human life go well. Thousands of years ago, he wrote his book called The Republic, which is like a classic in 
Western philosophy. Um, the Republic offers an account of what would make for the best human society. So like some kind of ideal utopian human society. That's what he calls the Republic. And the whole book is dedicated to trying to describe what that would be like and what it would take for that to happen. Um, overall, in the Republic, he argues that the ideal society should have these division of three parts. Okay, So there were the merchants, the warriors, and the kings. Merchants are the largest class of society, and those are basically the people who produce goods and services which they can then trade or sell for profit. So that's just a bunch of, you know, the working people in society, um, working a trade or craft, producing things, goods, services, whatever, to make money. That's most people in the Republic. Another category are the warriors. Their task is to provide for the security of the Republic. So they're like going to defend it against any external threats or internal instability, um, kind of like soldiers, military members, police forces, etc. They're not there to produce goods and services that they trade, like business people, but to provide security. And then you have a third category, which would be the kings. The kings are the political leadership class of the republic that make all the policy decisions, that institute laws, and that command and control the warriors. Now, in the republic, uh, Plato said, there should be a system of education and rigorous testing that divides people into the three given categories. So according to the description given in the book, there's one evaluation that happens after your primary education, and people who fail at that level will go into the warrior class. But if they pass, then they'll be appointed to higher education. If they complete their higher education and they surpass the second test, well, let me say what happens if they fail the second test. If they fail the second test, then they're in the merchant category, um, which is where most people land in the society. But if they continue on and surpass that standard, then they can go on to a third tier of higher education, which will eventually lead them into the kings of the society. So this means that in the Republic, um, political power was achieved not through democratic elections, but through um, educational attainment as proven in rigorous testing. And that was supposed to kind of block out or ensure that um, only skilled, intelligent, and you know wise people could have made it into the rank of kings. There's other things about it I haven't told you either. Like, for example, they said the kings were not allowed to have children, nor were they allowed to accumulate wealth. And that was supposed to make sure that people did not have the incentive to attain the power to start a political legacy or to become rich. Uh, so that was supposed to be a, you know, a backstop against corruption and uh, wanting to do it for the wrong reasons. But anyways, suppose that we have divided people into these different categories in the Republic according to the system described. The next thing that was talked about is that there's a virtue of each of the three parts of the Republic. And a virtue is a quality the thing would have if it's able to perform its function very well. Like in the case of a knife, which is there to cut, uh, the virtue of the knife would be being sharp, because that's what makes it good at cutting. So in the case of the three parts of the Republic, each one has a different virtue. The merchant class, which makes goods and services for profit, he says they ought to exhibit the virtue of temperance, which is having moderation and self-control of your appetites. This would ensure that the merchants do not become so greedy in the desire for profit that they basically become a bunch of con artists and frauds selling poor goods and services at an inflated rate and thereby to the detriment of the Republic. The um, warriors should be able to act with courage. So the virtue of warriors is courage, the willingness to face danger when it's right and necessary for the sake of the common defense. Um, you can't be a good soldier, police officer, whatever warrior in the language of Plato if you're not able to face danger and have the courage to do that. And then um, the third category of kings, they should have wisdom. Wisdom meaning the ability to make intelligent decisions and long-range plans based on the proper analysis. So when you have wise kings, courageous warriors, and temperate merchants, you have a well-run republic that's in its highest state. And he also men mentions that the three parts should not try to overstep their bounds, that they should each do their own work but not the work of other parts and especially that they should all peacefully submit to the right rule of the kings, not to challenge him or to overthrow the kings, but rather to willfully submit to them because they're fit to rule. So anyway, that's what it would be for an ideal republic. And by comparison to that, he says the individual human soul has certain similarities. Like the soul, he says, was divided into three parts. You've got your appetitive part, that's the appetites and desires that you have, the spirited part, that's like your passion and pride that's not willing to suffer a disrespect. And then you have the rational part of you, which is the intelligent decision-making deliberative part. And that is supposed to roughly compare to the merchants, warriors, and kings. You've got appetitive, spirited, and rational. 
And once again, the three parts of your soul should act according to the same virtue. Your appetitive nature should be in self-control with moderation and temperance. Your spirited nature should be able to act with courage and bravery under the guidance of your wisdom and reason when it's needed. And your reason should have intelligence and wisdom to make those good decisions. So when your soul is in the same structural harmony as the state, each part doing its own work according to its virtue and willfully and peacefully submitting to the rule of your intellect, then that would be the best life you could live. So Plato says you want to live your best life, empower your reason, allow it to preside over your passions and your appetites, keep those things in check and have everything working on its own virtue and you'll be living a good life. He says when people do bad things that are vicious, it's always because of an imbalance between these parts of the soul or one of the inferior parts gaining too much control and dominating the reason within you. And then he gives an example at the end about why bad behavior that no one ever discovers is not to your advantage. Some people think that injustice that goes undetected is going to somehow be better off for you. But he says no, and he makes the example of the three-headed creature to explain that. In the three-headed creature, there's the lion, which stands for the warriors, or I should say your, uh, your spirited nature, the gargoyles, which stand for the appetitive part, and the human head that stands for the reason within you. And he says, even if everyone else could only see the human face, but behind the scenes, the lion and gargoyles are attacking it, then that person's not living so well, even if no one can find it out. And he says that's the cost that you have to pay and the price that you'll have to pay if you want to behave badly and be unjust, because you're going to empower the inferior parts of your soul, and you'll perpetually be in an internal state of conflict as these parts of your soul try to drag along the human part wherever it wants to go. I don't know. I think about like drug addicts a lot when I talk about this part of the essay because, you know, take a person that's really addicted to drugs. They're so f filled with appetites for those pleasure pleasurable states that they're not listening to their better judgment or their or their intellect, you know. And sometimes they might even know. Look, this is not really good for me. My better judgment knows that, but I can't set aside my appetites because they're overwhelming. So that person's life is out of balance, even if maybe they have fun when they're on the drugs. I guess for a little while. So in the same way, you don't want the human part of you that's smart and intelligent to be just dragged along by your impulsive desires, appetites, or passions. Okay, so that's my little recap summary of the Plato stuff. Now let's continue, and we're going to go on to the next author. You're going to see a different account of what makes a human life go well today, which is really a major reversal or change from the Platonic view. And so now we're just zooming ahead 2,000 years in time to the 20th century and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. So here's the author. Jean Paul, you better mark it perhaps, Sartre. <clears throat> He's a French philosopher. Hopefully, my N sometimes looks like a U. I know that. Jean Paul Sartre, um, French philosopher of the 20th century, lived from 1905 to 1980. <clears throat> Since he is French and he had that soft R, I mean, it's hard to say for an American soft. Sartre is not exactly the right way, but it doesn't matter to me, just so you know. Jean-Paul Sartre. Now, he is well-known in philosophy, one of the big names of 20th century philosophy, because he is a major pioneer of a whole system of thought that um, is very influential and important now in the postmodern world that we're living in. It's called existentialism, and that is also the name of the essay that we've been assigned for today. So Jean-Paul Sartre, existentialism. Um, the version of it that we're reading was from a lecture he gave in 1945 in Paris. So that's the date of this particular piece of writing we're looking at. So Jean-Paul Sartre, the great 20th century French philosopher, um, and his essay Existentialism from 1945. Okay, so like I say to you, this idea of existentialism, the school of thought that it is, is... Um, is, where, is very important and widely known in philosophy and has had a large influence and an impact in, in the last century. Um, people could take a whole class or even a whole curriculum on existentialist thought and, and, and writing. Um, so really what I'm giving you today is definitely condensed down into just the basic facts about existentialism, but I've seen people teach whole classes of semester long where you just read a whole bunch of different existentialist literature from different authors. So. Certainly, as we've seen in a couple cases throughout this class, which surveys many of the major topics in philosophy, I'll just give you the sort of core essentials, but that'll be helpful and interesting in its own right. Okay, so let's learn about existentialism to the extent that we can in this little class period. The first thing I think you should know about existentialism is a core slogan that is kind of like 
right at the heart of it. And this slogan is always emphasized and mentioned by existentialist writers and thinkers. So let's start with this and try to explain it and understand it. So this kind of motto or slogan of existentialism is key. And it is a sentence or statement that existence precedes essence. So when you want to understand existentialism, you have to deal with this statement here and figure out what it means. Existence precedes essence. I'm going to break it down for you piece by piece, but actually we'll do it together. So let me work off of something that probably some of us already know the meaning of. One of the words in that is the word precedes. So let's ask, what is it for something to precede something else? What's the relationship of two things when A precedes B? Yes, you put that in chat. It's to come before. So if something precedes something else, it comes before that thing. Correct, Cordy and Sydney. Thank you. So would you say that the presidential election preceded this semester? It did, because it happened before that, right? So first there was the election and all the chaotic aftermath. And then our semester here at Chapman started sometime late January. So um, that preceded this. Your high school years, didn't that precede your college years? It did. It came before it. Um, I don't know. 2020 preceded 2021. So I'm giving you a bunch of examples, but they all have the same common element. That's it, when A precedes B for any A and B, A comes before B in time. All right. So now looking back at the claim or statement here, it does say existence precedes essence. So now it means that existence comes before essence. Existence is first, essence is later, after that. But now we have to figure out another word here, which is a little tougher perhaps at first. The word essence, all right? So what do you think the word essence means? I know it's not the most everyday word we always use, but it's perhaps somewhere in your vocabulary or you've seen it used. So if I ask you what's the essence of something, what am I even asking? What does this word mean to you, to anybody? Essence. Purpose. Purpose, you say? Hmm. For me, it's like, what does it make you feel other than Well, the essence that it has doesn't necessarily have to do, I mean, you might feel a certain way about the essence of something, but it wouldn't, wouldn't it still have that essence even if, like, say you died or something? Yeah, yeah, so it's, then your feelings wouldn't even exist. So we have to refer to the thing itself when we talk about its essence, you know? Um, I feel like I think about the nature of itself, like untouched, like you believe in God, like God's, you know? I like where you started with it. We went over the God was getting a little weird. But I think the thing you said at first was good. The nature of something, right? The nature of something, like what it is like, its core features. And Cordy here in the chat, you're saying something similar, except the soul of something is perhaps, maybe that's a little bit beyond, but um, actually ancient Greeks, did use the word essence to refer to something like the soul. Um, so let me bring these comments together and give you something clear. The essence of something, and this I think, ho hope it rings true to your existing understanding of it. The essence of something is like its core defining features, right? The essential, if you wanna think about it that way, the essential features that it has to have to be that kind of thing. Okay, so I'll put this on the board one time. Essence. <clears throat> The um, core, or let me say this, core is too, I think, ambiguous. Let me say the necessary uh, defining attributes of something. The essential defining attributes of something, that's what the essence of something is. The necessary defining attributes. So um, when you're talking about what it essentially is, you're talking about its core necessary features, that's its essence. Let me give you a quick example, something that will give us a concrete way to think about that. Okay, so here I'm throwing this out. Think about, go back to geometry and think of the square, the square, the polygon of the square. Um, can anybody tell me what is the essence of the square? So what are the necessary defining attributes of a square? Four sides, part of it. But there's also rectangles, huh? Four equal sides. Four equal sides, okay. But there is the diamond shape. So one more thing. 90 degree angles. Interior angles are all 90 degree right angles, correct. So with those three features, we've absolutely defined the essence of the square, haven't we? We've said that it's a four-sided figure with equal length sides where the inner angles are each 90 degrees. That's essential. That's essential. That's not like 
optional when it comes to being a square. All squares have four sides. All squares have equal length sides. And all squares have the interior angles being 90 degrees. There could be some squares that are bigger, some that are smaller, some that have different colors. But what's essential to them are those things. Okay, so that's the essence of the square. Now, let, let me follow up with one other question to make sure this is clear. How about the color blue? Is that part of the essence of the square? Is that essential to being a square, being blue? No, it's not, right. You can have a blue square, but it doesn't have to be blue to be a square. So blue is optional, but four sides is not. So four-sidedness and et cetera, that's essential. That's the essence of the square. Okay, so good. Now, this then says the following. Existence comes before essence. With the essence of a thing, I started with this kind of simple example of a square because it's something that we can clearly define and we know exactly what the essential features are. But the more interesting thing to consider, as Sart thinks, is that not just abstract objects like squares and things have essences, but even people like us do. Okay, so what's more interesting to think about is the essence not of the square, but of a human being like you or I. So um, <clears throat> what's the essence of a person? The essence of a person, according to the way we're looking at it, are the necessary defining attributes of that person that make them the person that they are. So each one of us has a, a unique identity, okay? Meaning that each one of us is a little bit different in terms of what our hobbies, interests, preferences, values, experiences are. And because of that, we all have a slightly different essence. Um, if I was going to talk to you about my own essence, let me just throw a few things out there. So who am I? I'm Richard Vulich. I'm a philosophy professor. I love music. I'm a creative person. I try to be fit, and so I'm an avid runner. I could talk to you about my religious views, my socio-political views. I could talk to you about my um, fashion taste or taste in music or food. And if I say all those things to you, you know what I'm doing? I'm explaining my essence. I'm explaining who I am and what makes me the unique individual that I am, maybe a little different from the person to my right or left. Okay, and the same could be said of you. If someone asks you, who are you all about? And you gave a really deep description of yourself. Here's what I believe. I'm a, I'm a Christian or I'm a Jew or I'm a Muslim or I'm an atheist. I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal. Um, I'm a, uh, I don't know, a person who likes this type of film or no, I like this other type of genre. Whatever you would say, right? And it's just everyone's an individual you'd be revealing to the audience or to the person what your essence really is. Okay, so hopefully so far we're getting some things clear. Ex existentialism assumes or claims that existence precedes essence, meaning that existence comes before essence. Precedes is to come before. Essence is the core defining attributes of something. So now let's fully understand it. It says this, when a human being is born, they don't have an essence yet. You start off and you're like a blank slate. So a baby that's born today is not um, religious, atheist, conservative, liberal, um, into, into um, comedy, no, into horror, no, into drama, that person is a blank slate right now. Their essence has not yet been filled in. But it will be afterwards. Okay, so this says you start with no essence and you're just a blank slate. And then through your life, over time, the essence will become established. Now, Existentialists, this is their core principle. Existence precedes essence, and they reject something that's the reverse. So I want to write it and cross it out just so that you know that they don't agree with this other statement. The other is just the opposite, that existence precedes essence. So I'm going to just write it only to cross it out. Can I ask a question while you're writing? Yeah, sure. Um, in philosophers or other people say that, is there like a specific time where essence stops? No. Okay. Good question. So, um, I was just going to, sorry, what? I, I, I'm sorry. Thank you. My bad guys. I, I wrote the same sentence twice when I crossed it out. Not my intention. Please correct the notes. Thank you so much. Essence precedes existence is rejected by existentialism. Thank you so much. See, we can all make mistakes. This is why you know I'm not a robot, right? So, um, <clears throat> This is rejected by the existentialists. Let me make a moment to make that very clear. Thanks, Cordy, and to also Sydney. Um, a classical idea from prior to the existentialist school of thinking was that we already have our essence given to us, and we just sort of live out the pattern that's somehow established from outside. Whether it was given to us by God or by nature, the claim would have been that your essence, your necessary defining traits and attributes, what makes you the person you are, is something that's somehow handed over to you, not that you created. They affirm this, they deny that. Okay, now to get to our 
Next point. If the essence is not there at the beginning, as the existentialist says, then in that case, where do you think they will say it comes from in the end? It's not there on day one, but then it's taking shape or it's already there later as you know time passes. Where do you think they would say it comes from? Because it's not there immediately. So where does this essence come from? You're saying surroundings there? Okay. That's one option, I guess. And I'm sure that many of you are thinking the same thing as you're seeing this discussion. You know, looking at yourself, you're probably like, well, if I have like certain religious views or not, it maybe comes from the way I was raised. You know, you're like, okay, I was growing up in a certain household where these views and these beliefs were held and it kind of came down to me. Or you might say, well, my mom, my dad, or my culture or my community somehow influenced me. So your first thought might've been your environment, but I have to tell you, no. That's not it. That's not it. No. So just sit there for a minute and realize, no, it's not coming from your environment or from anything outside of you. So where does the existentialist think it actually comes from? Look in the mirror. It comes from you. It comes from your own free choices. You're the one who chooses to be the way that you are. So you ever sit there and you're like, why am I like this? Existentialism is telling you because of you, because you have free will and because you've chosen to be the way that you are. So if you are the conservative, the liberal, the theist, the atheist, the person who likes this type of music or that type of music or that likes this type of food or that type of food or this type of film. Those are choices that you have made out of your own free will. So there's no other thing that's external to you, the individual, that has created your essence. It's all on you. You're totally responsible for it, and so you have to own it. So that's like the first major thing that existentialism really tries to emphasize to the reader, that each one of us creates our own essence individually through our free will and choices. And the one thing they really is, uh, insist upon is that you not try to place the responsibility for your essence on external factors that you cannot control. Um, so let me read a little bit of the first couple of passages here from the essay. One thing he talks about in this initial passage is how the fact that we have free will as humans to create our own essence um, makes us uh, more important and have a greater dignity and value than everything else in the universe. Because... All right, take like a leaf that's blowing around in the wind. The leaf cannot choose anything. It cannot say, what kind of leaf will I be? Will I be different from these other leaves or am I going to be the same? Or am I going to blow myself over in this direction or that direction? No. The leaf is just an object that's caught up in the physical forces of the universe and they will govern everything about where it ends up landing and what happens to it. So it's not a free being like you or I. But even animals and other lower life forms take like a... a a lion, a tiger, a bear, or something that's out there in nature. They don't have the same options that we do as humans. A, a little lion or something that's born today doesn't have the thought or can't have the thought, what kind of lion will I be? Will I be conservative, liberal, religious, atheist? Am I going to take a business major? Am I going to focus on art? Maybe I'll just travel the world, study philosophy or religion. They don't have all those options. So there's pretty much just one cookie cutter pattern for every animal to live out, you know, eat, sleep, maybe reproduce, and then that's it. But for a human, we're presented with almost infinite choices. You can, and you know that you can, take your life in almost any direction that you wish. And we see all the different possible options that people actually do take. So we have a free will and a choice about the way our life and our essence shapes. And that, he says, gives us greater dignity than everything else. So let me read now. And yes? Um, is it, are there parts of your essence that like, you could be born with? Like, what if you're born with like, a, like some sort of disease? Or something? Okay, okay, yeah. So you're talking about... You're asking me if there's some aspects of your own being that you simply cannot take control or, or choose, like if you were born with some kind of maybe disability or whatever. Well, what Sartre would say is that even when you're presented with like a cognitive or physical disability, you still have a, free, a range of free choices to make that don't constrain the way you'll end up. So like, right, a person who has, let's say, muscular dystrophy or something can still choose what kind of person they want to be. So even though there are some things about the circumstances of your birth that you can't choose, he actually has a word for that. It's called facticity. But let me get to that in a minute because I want to read this quote. I'll be right back with you. So quote from the book, he says here, man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the first principle of existentialism. It is also what is called subjectivity. But what do we mean by this if not that man has a greater dignity than a stone or a table? Because we mean that man first exists that is, that man, first of all, is the being who hurls himself towards the future, 
and who is conscious of imagining himself as being in the future. Man is at the start a plan, which is aware of itself, rather than a patch of moss, a piece of garbage, or a cauliflower, just random things that don't have free will. Nothing exists prior to the plan. You will be what you have planned to be, not uh, because by the word will, we generally mean a conscious decision, which is subsequent to what we have already made of ourselves. Now he talks about some of the basic choices that do shape a person's life and essence. I may want to belong to a political party, write a book, get married, but all that is only a manifestation of a spontaneous choice that is called will. But if existence really does precede essence, man is responsible for what he is. Thus, existentialism's first move is to make every man aware of what he is and to make the full responsibility of his existence rest on him. Okay, so he kind of emphasizes and insists that you take, uh, you know, that you kind of own who you are and you don't try to blame others or external factors for it. Now, there's this word, and I was about to speak on it um, in, re in reaction to your question, Sydney. There's a term of art in existential thought. If there's anything that's like bad or a no-no within existentialism, it's this, and it's called bad faith. <clears throat> so in, his, in the usage of the author, bad faith has a specific meaning. It is just whenever you try to place responsibility for your essence on some external factors that you could not control. Okay, so... Okay, so when you try to place the responsibility for your essence on some external things that you have no control over, that's what he calls bad faith. So, for example, imagine somebody saying, um, look, I'm not like this because I chose to be. I'm like this because of the way my parents raised me, you know, so I'm so religious because I grew up in the religious household. Or um, I'm always kind of a little argumentative because my parents argued a lot and that's just how we were and so I kind of followed in their example. Um, or you might say, oh, it's because of the time that I grew up in. When I grew up back in that time, our culture was such that we thought these things and not these other things. And so that's the reason I have these beliefs. But in every single case there, that's all bad faith. The only right answer is, I'm like this because I chose to be that way. Oh, yeah, with astrology for sure, Cordy. Yeah, people, it's funny. Um, we're supposed to believe simultaneously that people are free to be whatever they want, including have any gender and any kind of orientation and everything else. But you can't choose your astrological sign, huh? That's, that's, that's essential to you. Anyway, it's funny to me, that stuff. But back to what I was saying. Um, bad faith is just a response that some people have when they don't like certain aspects of their own essence, and they're trying to shift the burden of blame or responsibility to outside factors. Sartre would say that's all bad faith, and you have to own it. You have to take control and responsibility for the fact that you've chosen to be the way that you are. So in existentialism, I mean, if there's something about your own essence that you don't like, you're like, why am I so impatient or why do I get angry so easily or whatever if there's something about yourself that you would like to improve on existentialism says well it's still your fault though that you're like that it's not anybody else's or anyone else's fault uh, but if you like certain things about your essence and you're proud of those things then I guess the bright side is you get to take total credit for it it's not anyone else's um, to anyone else's credit that you are the way you are because your free will chooses to be this way now the next thing that he says is another part of his uh, philosophy here that's interesting, which is the idea that by creating your own essence, you kind of create a paradigm of the good life for all of humanity. So I'm going to write that and then try to explain a little and read some of his words too. So by creating your own essence, you also create a model of the good life for all humanity. Okay, just by creating your own essence, you also create this model of the good life for everybody. Um, so now, if you think about it, in existentialism, who creates your essence? Just you. Um, and 
since it's totally on, on you and it's up to you, the way that you end up being reflects your perspective on what would be the best way for humans to live. Okay, because when you choose the things that you've chosen about your essence, that shows your values. It shows the things that you think are good and bad. Let me give you a quick example. Okay, just using myself as a case, as the case. So you know that I'm a philosophy professor, I'm your philosophy professor. So that's what I've done with my own life. That's a big part of my essence, that I've chosen this academic path into philosophy and the academy. So if other people were to do the same thing I've done, what do you think would be my view about it? It's good or bad. So if someone tells me, I'm gonna study philosophy, do you think I would say to them, what the hell, that's a weird thing to do with your life? Me, I mean, other people I'm sure do say that, like, you know, everybody, but not me. Why wouldn't I say that? It's obvious, isn't it? Just tell me. Because I picked it. So wouldn't it be weird to say this is the thing that I wanted to do with my life, which I think is good for me, but it's not good for others? That's not true. So when you do something and when you make it a part of your own essence, that affirms the value of it. Let's give another case. Say that someone's religious, right? Like a Christian or something. And then they meet someone else that's a Christian. Do you think they're going to say, what are you doing with your life? Why are you a Christian? No. They'll say that's a good thing for you. Why? Because they chose it too. So, of course, your own choices reflect what you think is good for people to do in general. So when Sartre says you create your own essence, it's kind of like you're also creating a paradigm of how you think people ought to live. So if you're an atheist, you think it's good for people to be an atheist. If you're a Christian, you think it's good for people to be a Christian. If you want to get married or something, have kids, then when other people do it, you think that's a good thing to do because that's what I've done with my life. So I believe in those choices. So um, that's why he says that it's kind of it's, it's a metaphor. But he says when you create your own self, you create all of humanity. I hope you now understand his me metaphorical statement. It doesn't literally mean you create all of humanity because obviously you just create your own being, if anything. But you create all of humanity sort of in the sense that your own example stands as what you think people ought to do. So you're like, I'm doing it the right way. I'm living the way people should live. And so when others follow the same pattern, you, you appreciate or at least don't condemn it or disagree with it. Um, let me read then from the book and you'll see him say this. He says, subjectivism means, on the one hand, that an individual chooses and makes himself, and on the other hand, that it is impossible for you to transcend your subjectivity. The second of these is the essential meaning of existentialism. Now, when we say that man chooses his own self, we mean that every one of us does likewise. But we also mean by that that in making this choice, he chooses all men. By the way, and you guys I'm sure know this, this is a little bit of an old-fashioned thing, but in referring to man, it's humankind. He just uses the male pronoun. But anyway... In fact, in creating the man that we want to be, there is not a single one of our acts which does not at the same time create an image of man as we think he ought to be. To choose to be this or that is to affirm the value of what we choose, because we could never choose what we think is not good for ourselves, and therefore we think it is good for all. And so now he says more. If existence precedes essence, and if we grant that we fashion our own image, then this image is valid for everybody and for our whole age. So your responsibility is greater than you might have thought because it involves all of mankind. If I am a working man and I choose to join a Christian trade union rather than to be a communist, and if by being a member I want to show that this is the best, then I'm not only involving my own case, I'm doing so for everyone. As a result, my action has involved all of humanity. And to take other examples, if I want to marry, have children, even if this only depends on my own circumstances, I'm involving all humanity in monogamy. Therefore, I'm responsible for myself and for all others. In creating a certain image of man of my own choosing, I choose mankind to be that way. So remember in Plato's work, he said, we should all do the same thing. We should all try to empower our intellect and allow that to preside over our appetites and passions. And that's basically the blueprint for the best life. Now, as you can see from Sartre, it's way different because according to what we're learning here, what is the best life that a person can live? In a way, it's just already what? What is your so-called best life in the existentialist thought? What do you think? I mean, if your essence reflects your values, then the best life that you can live is already which one? It's the one that you're already building and creating. Because if you thought there was a better life available to you, then you would live that different life and make different choices. So if you thought that not being a college student was better and you didn't want to get a bunch of dead and you just wanted to like travel and experience things, then you'd make that different decision and you would think that would be a better life. But apparently that's not your choice, right? You've decided that getting your education and setting yourself up is going to be the best way to go. So this reflects your values. Um, but there's no universal answer, says Sartre, as to what 
the best life is. Each one of us as an individual just creates our own essence and we present that to the world as our thought about what should be done in terms of living your life. So notice that, right? It's very subjectivist. It's not like he's saying, hey, everyone, set your passions and appetites aside and just get smart and reasonable. Because if you're smart, right, and someone says, look, I don't care about what Plato said. I just want to take all the money and rip as many people off. And that's making me happy. And that's my best life. Sartre would say, well, you reflect that as your value by choosing it. And you even don't mind if other people live that way because they're doing the same thing as you. So there's no like universal standard to attain to in Sartre's view. It's just that it's radically subjectivist. Each one creates an essence. The essence that you do create stands as your example of how all people should live. And there's no answer as to which one is better. Some people agree with others on the pattern of life that is best, but none of them is sort of like the objective right answer. So we're allowed, I guess, in his view, to have the diversity of different essences that reflect our own individual project of building a good life, okay? Um, so some people might like that because there's this subjective element to it. And you might have thought, it's a little imposing upon me and my liberty to choose how I want to live to be told by this Plato that I should like try to overcome the impulses of my passions and appetites. But there's sort of a dark side though to this existentialist stuff too. So let me try and build that up a little bit. Um, one of the things that Sartre says, which is a kind of famous quote that's in this essay, is a quote that's a little confusing when you first read it. So I want to try and make sure it makes sense. The statement is this, that we are condemned to be free. Okay, let me write it here and then try to go through it for a bit. <clears throat> condemned to be free. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna speak about that in a second here, but to Sydney, one one last thing. You you said that um um what was it that there's some things that you can't necessarily choose, like um, if you had a disease or disability, something like that. The word that Sartre uses for those kinds of factors is this word. It's facticity, and that's like a another technical word within existentialist thought. Facticity. Facticity is like a word to refer to things about yourself that you could not have chosen, but he says those don't affect your essence ultimately. So think about circumstances of your birth, like when you're born. You can't choose. Yeah, you know, I want to be born right around the year 2000. That's a good time to get into this universe. I mean, obviously, that's a choice that's made on your behalf by your parents when they conceive you or where you're born. You can't be like, yeah, America, they got the most wealth. They seem to have a lot of stability. I want to be born in America. So I'm going to just choose to be starting off there. Nor can you choose who your parents are going to be. Um, like, I want these, this couple to be my parents. So I'm going to go with them. So anyway, there are some factors about yourself that for sure you can't control. But in the end, he says that doesn't really affect the way your essence is because a person born anywhere to any parents, et cetera, can still have a range of free choices. Um, and like I was saying before about the circumstances of your upbringing and parentage, um, in the same kind of household environment, people will still make different decisions. One person might say, my parents are religious and I agree with that and I want to follow their example. Another person with a different free will is going to say, no, I reject the example of my parents and I want to be different from them. And so none of these things sort of sets an absolute boundary where you can't have a free choice to do otherwise. Okay, so that's kind of what he says about that. Yes? I might be a little off topic, but um, does he say anything about like if you were forced and chose not to, for example? Like if you were like, like had to be forced to do everything? Yeah, but you might not feel inside like you'd like it though. And that's your free choice. Some people will be like, well, they're making me do these things, but I kind of like it. And after a while, I agree with it. Other people will have a different assessment using their free will. Like, I don't identify with this. And so it's up to you. Like, for example, can I walk up to you or anybody and be like, yo, you believe in God now. That, you're welcome. I can't make you believe in God. You have to choose on your own. So even if your parents or community or church is saying this is what we want you to believe, we already know that you could, like, defy those people and say I don't want to. And they don't want you to do that. But you have your free will. So free will doesn't get eliminated just by people putting pressure on you to do a certain thing. Your free will is still there. And inside you might even behave in a way that conforms while you're thinking, I don't agree with it. Yeah. So um, to the quote up there, though, we are condemned to be free. Um, <clears throat> so you might say that looks like an oxymoron, because typically when a person says they're condemned to anything, that means your freedom is removed. Like I'm condemned to prison or I'm condemned to a death sentence. Condemned to be free sounds like it doesn't make sense because freedom is like the opposite of being constrained by anything. So what does it mean to be condemned to be free? Well, he says this, according to existentialist thought, 
we're radically free and we control our whole essence, right? But in a way, it's kind of stressful, isn't it, making big decisions that are going to shape the whole course of your life and what you're going to be. Just think about choosing a major. I mean, for some people, it's very easy because there's only one thing you really wanted to do. But for a lot of people, it's a very tough decision, as you can probably relate to in some cases, because it sets um, so much about what you're going to do with the whole rest of your life. And that's just one decision. What about whether to marry, who to marry, when to get married, whether to have kids, where, how many, where to live? Um, you know, there's so many little decisions, big and small, that we face. And sometimes it's like we would like someone else to be able to take over for us. Like, hey, can you just run my life for me so I don't have to make all these tough decisions with all these big consequences? But here's the thing. If existentialism is true and you have free will, then you're never going to be able to get off this carousel of making decisions. There's just going to be decisions coming at you, and you have to keep using your free will to make them. Now, it's a little frustrating, too, because normally when you make a choice, you want to make what you think is the right choice, quote unquote. But what is the right choice according to existentialism? There's no objective fact. So what's the right choice? Should a person be religious or not? Well, it depends on their own subjective viewpoint. And so it kind of deprives you of the feeling that there's any objective answer to what the choices ought to be. So isn't that kind of a catch-22? I want to do the right thing. But whatever the right thing is, is just defined by my own subjective viewpoint on it. And so now it looks like I'm doing these big, important things with no objective basis. So if that sounds frustrating to be forced to keep making free decisions with no objective basis, you're kind of alone with your free will, well, you're condemned to live that way. That's the human condition. Humans are free, and that's what you've got to be burdened with if it is a burden. It's also kind of a privilege, but if it's a burden, it's a burden you carry with you forever. So kind of like an uh, ironic statement because the one thing you're not free – you're free to do anything in existentialism, to be anybody you want to be. But the one thing you're not free to do is to not be free. Okay, so you can be free to do anything you said to not be free. Some people say, oh, I didn't even choose to be alive, you know, so that wasn't a choice I made. But Sartre doesn't even give you that. He says, well, the fact that you're still alive is certainly up to you because people can choose to end their lives at any time and you're not doing that. So you're alive through your own free will and your essence that you're shaping is up to you. Now, um, there's a little interaction that he had with a student that he puts in the essay to kind of give us a sense of this last point um, and to also give us further insight into the theory overall. So this is a real life uh, anecdote from Sartre's life. So he lived in, you know, during the World War II era and he was a philosophy professor at the time in Paris. He had a student that came to him and they said this during the World War II time period. They're like, okay, I have a moral dilemma, Mr. Sartre, Professor Sartre, I need your help or maybe you could help me. Because, okay, on the one hand, I'm really interested in joining the French forces so that I can help defeat the Nazis and, and defend my country. Um, that's important to me, and I really want to do it. But if I go, I'll have to leave behind my mother, who I'm caring for right now. And she's already lost my older brother to the war, and she's also getting older and a little more sick, but we're very close. I've always, we have a very close bond. And I know that it would probably make her, first of all, really upset for me to leave and she might not have the help that she wants around the house. But I want to help my mom, so I love because I love her so much. But if I stay with her, I can't go fight. And if I go fight, then I can't stay with her. So one way or the other, it's a tough moral decision, and I'm not sure what the right choice is. So Professor Sartre, can you help me make the quote-unquote right choice? Now he's talking to like the arch existentialist, Sartre. So what do you think Sartre would say is the so-called right choice? Maybe it's a frustrating answer, but what is his answer? Whatever you choose to do, because there's no objective fact here. You're the person whose free will will select the action that you think is in line with your own essence. Now, the student might have thought this thought. Can't I make the choice based on which type of person I am? If I know what my essence is, then that'll help me make the right choice. So am I the big, you know, am I the noble fighter, the brave warrior, or am I the loving son that dotes on his mother? If I know which kind of essence I have, then maybe I'll make the choice based on that. But once again, what Sartre would say is that which type of person you at you are the fighter versus the doting son, that actually depends on what? And which essence you have is something that is actually going to be determined by what? Let me know if you can figure that one out. Well, sort of, but uh, more specifically, whether you are the doting son or whether you are the brave warrior, choice. it depends on the choice that you end up making. Right? Because the choice makes it real that that is your essence because you commit yourself to that action. So in a way, you cannot refer to the existing essence that's already fully established in making your next decision. Because I guess this goes back to you, Dennis. The essence is always open-ended. It's a project that's never finished. It's indefinite. So um, right now, you can make free choices that change the essence that you have into a different direction. 
Therefore, you can never say I've got this finished product essence and it just makes all the decisions for me. Can't eliminate your free will. It's still there, thinking and choosing. So let me read about it from the book and you'll see the author say this. He said, the boy was faced with the choice of leaving for England and joining the French forces, leaving his mother behind, or remaining with her, helping her carry on. He was aware that she lived only for him and that if he left, that would plunge her into despair. He was also aware that everything he did for his mother's sake was a sure thing, whereas going off to fight in the war was uncertain because you don't know how the result will be. So um, at the same time, he was wavering be between two kinds of ethics, one of personal sympathy and devotion and the other of national service. Who could help him choose? So now he says, here's how some people might think, oh, I can be directed to the right choice by other external sources, like maybe the Bible. He says, Christian doctrine? No. Look at the Bible and you can read its scriptures, but you still have to interpret them yourself. It says, be charitable, love your neighbor, take the more rugged path. But which one is the more rugged path? I mean, they're both rugged. Staying behind with your mother while people are fighting on your behalf or fighting while you leave your mother behind. How can you interpret which one is the more rugged? It says, whom should you love as brother, the fighting man or his mother? Which does the greater good, the act of fighting for your country or the concrete action of helping one loved person go on living? Who could decide a priori? Nobody. Maybe you think Kant can help you. The Kantian ethic says never treat a person as a means, but always as an end. Very well. But if I stay with my mother, I'll treat her as an end and not as a means. But by virtue of this fact, I treat the people fighting on my behalf as a means to my security. And if I go and fight with them, then I treat the soldiers and the fighting forces as an end. But I treat my mother as a means for providing for me so much. And now that I just leave her care. So the values themselves and the way that you interpret them is still subjective. And it's up to your own individual judgment. Therefore, we're really condemned to be free. We cannot escape the burden of having free will and knowing that it is simply on you to make these choices independently and without the kind of training wheels or steering guide of having a fully established essence or some kind of external um, guarantee of what the essence ought to be or what the action ought to be. So finally then in the end, um, the last kind of thing he says is this. To think of existentialism in a way, you have to consider it as a view that embraces optimistic toughness. This is another one of his key phrases, optimistic toughness, that there's two emphases there. So the optimistic part comes from the idea that you're free in existentialist thought, free to be anyone that you want to be. Um, so you're like not limited in any way um, by your parentage, by your genetics, by your upbringing, your environment or your culture. You're free to take your life in any direction you want using your free will, and that's totally a liberating feeling. So there's the optimism. But the toughness part comes from you having to, in the end, accept the burden of responsibility for the results. Since you have great freedom, you have total responsibility too. So you have complete control over your own essence, but you should not engage in bad faith in trying to uh, assign responsibility for it to other things. And so that's what he says at the end. He says, when all is said and done, what we are accused of is optimistic toughness. If people throw up to us our works of fiction in which we write about people who are soft, weak, cowardly, and sometimes bad, it's not because these people are soft, weak, cowardly, or bad because of their heredity or environment or their biological or psychological determinism or society. If that was the case, people would be reassured. They would say, well, that's what they're like, and no one can do anything about it. But when the existentialist writes about a coward, he says this coward is responsible for their cowardice. He's not like that because he has a cowardly heart or brain or lung. He's not, a cow he's not like that because of his blood. There's no such thing as a cowardly constitution. A constitution is not an act. The coward is defined on the basis of the acts that he chooses. People feel in a vague sort of way that the coward we're talking about is guilty of being a coward and that thought frightens them. What people would like instead is that the coward or the hero was born that way. So he says there's a kind of sense of security in the feeling that none of us have any control over our outcomes as human beings, the way that we turn out, the way that our personality and identity turns out. Thinking that people have the freedom to choose this bothers some folks because then it's like you have to say, well, the, you know, the evil person chooses evil or the coward person chooses cowardice, not that they just find themselves in the circumstance unwittingly. But in existentialism, you have to be tough enough to think that people do have free will and they do have their own choices. So when we studied like, you know, space time, we said everything's determined, all the future space time points already exist. Existentialism at least radically rejects that because it's all the core foundation of it is that we have free will and that nothing determines what we're going to be or what we're going to do except your, tr your own choices. So there's something nice about that, even though there are some burdens of freedom and free will as well that he talks about. 
So I guess that's it for today. We have a radically individualistic, subjectivist account of the best life from Sartre that's contrasted with platonic view that's much more universalistic and objective. On Friday, we'll look at Derek Parfit, and his view sort of sits in between the two, I think, and it's a nice hybrid of the two subjective and objective accounts. So we'll get into that on Friday. For now, anyway, uh, um, have a great one. Let me know that everything's good. Sorry to keep you an extra minute. Uh, and when you're ready to sign off and I see you in the chat, then I'll close the stream and we'll be back on Friday. Don't forget to submit your essay to me before uh, class time on Friday, too. Okay, thanks, Zoe. And Angel and Sebastian, Cordy and everybody else. Thanks again. Have a good one. And um, I'll be in touch. Okay, bye-bye.